Namaste, Namaskar, and good evening to each one of you who have joined us today. Esteemed dignitaries and your participants, I, Rupa Priya JK, Assistant Professor in the Department of Civil Engineering, and also the Training and Placement Officer of VVC MISAW, will be your host for the day. I request every one of you to kindly mute as we proceed with our today's program. Thanks for your cooperation. Respected members of the management of Vidya Vardhaka Sangha, Sri Gundapa Gauda, the Honorable President of Vidya Vardhaka Sangha, and Engineer Sri Vishwanath, Vishwanath, Honorable Secretary of Vidya Vardhaka Sangha, Respected Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, Executive Director, National Institute of Disaster Management Government of India, New Delhi, our beloved Principal, Dr. B. Sadashiv Gauda, Organizing Chairs, Dr. Chandan Ghosh, Professor at National Institute of Disaster Management, Government of India, New Delhi. Dr. S.K. Prasad, Professor and Head of the Department of Civil Engineering, PVC Mysore. Dr. H.S. Dayananda, Dean Academic Affairs. Dr. G.B. Krishnappa, Dean R&D. Dr. Umesh P.K., Professor, Department of Civil Engineering, PVC Mysore. Our respected resource persons of the day, Dr. D.G. Sitaram, who is the Director at IIT Guwahati, and Dr. Selvi Ranjan, who is the director advisor at IIT Madras Chennai, and our dear professors, professionals, and dear students. Warm greetings to you from VVC Mysore. The world is changing and we must change with it. Disasters cannot be avoided, but we can be prepared to mitigate and prevent the damage associated with it. With these important facts in mind, and considering the importance of disaster management, the National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, New Delhi, and the Department of Civil Engineering, Vidya Vardhaka College of Engineering, Mysore, Karnataka, have jointly organized this three-day online training program on futuristic research in disaster resilience from June 11th to 13th, 2021. It is a golden opportunity for all the participants to enrich their knowledge and to interact with eminent personalities like Dr. T.G. Sitaram, the, the director at IIT Guwahati, Dr. Selvi Ranjan, IIT Madras, Dr. P. Vedagiri, IIT Bombay, Dr. Chandan Ghosh, NITM New Delhi, Dr. K.S. Babunarayan, NITK Suratkal, Dr. C.V.R. Murthy, IIT Madras, and Dr. Mahendra Singh, IIT Roorkee. Before we begin this program, let us invoke the blessings of God. To do this, I would like to request Chikana, civil engineering student studying in the first year of our college, Vidya Vardhaka College of Engineering, Mysore, to render the invocation. Over to you, Chikana. Thank you, ma'am. ಓಯನ್ನು ಬಣಪ ಕರೆದಾಗ ಓಯನ್ನು ಬಣಪ ಗಣಪ ಓಯನ್ನು ಬಣಪ ಕರೆದಾಗ ಓಯನ್ನು ಬಣಪ ಓಂಕಾರನಾದಲೋಲ ಹೇ ಗಣಪ ಓಂಕಾರ ರೂಪ ಶ್ರೀ ಗಣಪ ಓಯನ್ನು ಬಣಪ ಕರೆದಾಗ ಓಯನ್ನು ಬಣಪ ಮಾಯ ವಿನಾಶಕ ಮೋಷಿಕ ವಾಹನ ಮಾತ ಭವಾನಿ ಪಾರ್ವತಿ ನಂದನ ಮಾಯ ವಿನಾಶಕ ಮೋಷಿಕ ವಾಹನ ಮಾತ ಭವಾನಿ ಪಾರ್ವತಿ ನಂದನ ಮಹಗಣಪತೆ ಪರಮದಯಾಗನ ಮಹಗಣಪತೆ ಪರಮದಯಾಗನ ಶಂಭೋ ನಂದನ ಕರವೆನು ಶಂಭೋ ನಂದನ ಕರವೆನು ಓಯನ್ನು ಬಣಪ ಕರೆದಾಗ ಓಯನ್ನು ಬಣಪ ಗಜ ಮುಖದವನೆ ಗಣಗಳಿ ಗೋಡೆಯ ಮೊದಲ ಪೂಜೆಯನು ಪಡೆಯುವ ದೇವನಿ 
ಗಜ ಮುಖದವನೇ ಗಣಗಳಿ ಗೋಡೆಯ ಮೊದಲ ಪೂಜೆಯನು ಪಡೆಯುವ ದೇವನಿ ಆತ್ಮಲಿಂಗವನು ದರೆಯಲಿ ಇಟ್ಟವನೇ ಆತ್ಮಲಿಂಗವನು ದರೆಯಲಿ ಇಟ್ಟವನೇ ಬಾಲ ಗಣೇಶನೇ ಕರೆವೆನು ನಾ ಬಾಲ ಗಣೇಶನೇ ಕರೆವೆನು ನಾ ಓ ಎನ್ನು ಬಾ ಗಣಪ ಕರೆದಾಗ ಓ ಎನ್ನು ಬಾ ಗಣಪ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಅರುಣ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಚಿಕ್ಕನ್ನ ಫಾರ್ ಮೇಕಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಪ್ರೋಗ್ರಾಮ್ ಮೋರ್ ಆಸ್ಪೀಷಿಯಸ್ ವಿತ್ ಮೆಲೋಡಿಯಸ್ ಇನ್ವೊಕೇಶನ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು on this special occasion i feel extremely happy to introduce a person whose areas of interest are earthquake geotechnical engineering and performance based design one of his international publications is on earthquake disaster management in different countries influence of culture of religion where he has provided an insight on some of the problems associated with infrastructure from earthquakes and performance of infrastructure during earthquake all over the globe the indian scenario is briefly discussed in comparison to other countries and emphasis is made to enhance practices of earthquake resistant construction in our country that's our respected hod of civil engineering dr sk prasad who secured first rank in engineering was awarded gold medals and cash prizes pursued mtech in it kanpur and pursued his phd from the university of tokyo japan I request Dr. S.K. Prasad to kindly present the welcome address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, madam. Very good <coughs> evening, everybody. We are all in the midst of the pandemic. We all know how difficult the situation has been for over a year. Government and other concerned organizations are trying hard to manage the problem, reduce the damage, bring down economic instability and decrease the loss of life but that's not enough we need to get back to normalcy we need to come back to the original situation this is what defines resilience national institute of disaster management nidm has been working very hard in this direction creating awareness and to implement resilience during different disasters vidya vardhaka college of engineering mysore popularly called vvce has been in the forefront in imparting engineering and management education we have seven undergraduate programs including civil engineering and three postgraduate programs i'm really proud and happy to state that all our undergraduate programs are accredited by nba and the institution has nac accreditation with an a grade it is an autonomous college under vishveshwaraya technological university and is among the highly sought institutions for engineering admissions in karnataka pvc is not only providing excellent teaching learning environment to about 3000 students through 220 competent faculty members but also focuses on research and innovation these two organizations nidm and vvce have joined together for this 3 day online program on futuristic research in disaster resilience involving seven excellent and eminent speakers i'm proud and happy to welcome the dignitaries and participants for the inauguration of the training program firstly Let me take pleasure in inviting Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, Executive Director at NIDM, in his absence. As he is preoccupied, he will not be on the platform, but he has sent his best wishes for the success of this online training program. Let me then welcome my you know, very beloved friend and uh, you know uh, with whom i have a, a, a contact for over two decades professor chandan bosh who is a senior professor at nidm in fact you know uh, he has not got just one doctorate he has two doctorates one doctorate from 
IIT Kanpur and the other one in Japan from Ibaraki University. I welcome Professor Chandan Ghosh for this uh, inaugural. I welcome Sri Gunda Pagoda, Honorary President Vidyavarda Kasanga, and Engineer P. Vishwanath, former and first mayor of Mysore city, and Honorary Secretary of Vidyavarda Kasanga. We are fortunate to have you both here, sir. And you are the constant source of inspiration for all activities of this kind. I also welcome Professor P.G. Sitaram, Director IIT Guwahati, who will be joining us in about 30 minutes' time for a keynote followed by his first lecture. Sir, we are honored that you accepted to be part of the inauguration and then to deliver the first lecture in spite of being very busy. I take this opportunity to welcome respected principal of Vidyavardaka College of Engineering, Professor B. Sadashive Gowda, who is the main pillar of our institute and motivator for all such programs. I also welcome Sri B. Shivalingappa, Honorary Vice President Vidyavardaka Sangha, Sri Shishaila Ramannavar, Honorary Treasurer Vidyavardaka Sangha for the inaugural function. I welcome Dean Academics, Professor H.S. Dayanand, and Dean R&D, Professor G.B. Krishnappa, and all other deans, heads of the departments, faculty members of Vidyavardaka College of Engineering for the inauguration. I welcome the technical team, staff, faculty members, and students of the Department of Civil Engineering. I welcome the other honorable speakers, Professor C. V. R. Murthy of IIT Madras, Professor Mahendra Singh of IIT Roorkee, Professor Selvi Rajan, Dr. Selvi Rajan, advisor at IIT Madras, Professor Vedagiri from IIT Bombay, Professor Babu Narayan from NIT Suratkal, and the members of staff and faculty of NIDM. Most importantly, let me welcome the participants. I'm happy that you all have registered in large numbers amounting to maybe around 800 as I heard last. We have academicians, researchers, working professionals, and students as participants. And you are the backbone of any such program. I wish you all will have a great time. My big welcome is to all of you who have assembled online. Thank you. Back to Professor Rupa Priya. Thank you so much, sir. A warm welcome to you too for this inaugural function. We are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Chandit Ghosh, Professor, National Institute of Disaster Management, Government of India, New Delhi, who believes that the disaster risk reduction is possible only through promotion of a culture of prevention involving all stakeholders. He is a proud member of the National Institute of Disaster Management, which has a vision to create a disaster resilient India by building the capacity at all levels for disaster prevention and preparedness. So will be a part of all the sessions and he will be interacting with all the participants. So we are so happy to have you, sir. Thank you. So, <clears throat> but it is a very august uh, gathering that uh, in this afternoon, uh, I feel really touched by the arrangement that you have made uh, in the team and family and the, the host of students uh, that whom you have attracted with Honorable uh, uh, the President, Secretary, Principal, all the Dean, every one of you uh, that making an institute, the name itself, the Bidda Bardaka is a, is a very pure uh, on a Sanskrit come Bengali name. Uh, uh, that name, uh, it has registered not as a VVCE, of course, it is a key word, but Vidya Bardaka. Uh, that is a name that which has really made my heart really touched. Uh, the uh, engineering college having uh, that's, uh, that too in Mysore, where I have visited at least uh, more than 10 times in the last 10-15 years, 
of my uh, being over here in an IDM. Uh, we have that uh, that flavor of going there and meeting many of our friends and and, uh, uh, and also uh, that the place that uh, which is having uh, such an ambience that uh, it is a temple that you have made and the temple that you are you are running with the young minds and training them making them uh, worthy for the country so what from this side in delhi from an idm we just touched upon the uh, string uh, with uh, professor uh, prasha uh, just uh, over that that uh, he wanted me to invite uh, to give a lecture on something that i can speak uh, so, uh, in that case, then uh, the proposal that, okay, why not we join hands? So, that way we made hands. And that joining of hands is not only defined that how many decades of friendship that we are having. It is not by counting the two decades or even IIT Kanpur or even uh, Japan connection that uh, we had. But it is that uh, your presence in the team as HOD and also that you have made everyone uh, over there your and making a line of instruction, communication and information, organization, synchronization of the things that you have uh, uh, given uh, all sorts of uh, lightening, enlightening, uh, you know, uh, being a member, not as a leader, you never considered yourself as a leader, but being a member of the bigger team under the Vidya Baddhaka uh, uh, College of Engineering uh, team and Sangha, that it is a really eye-opening and very touchy, enlightening moment uh, for all of us and for all the participants and through the negativity of COVID effect, but positivity that uh, made vibrant in this gathering or in this occasion, uh, it, it makes, I think, all of us really uh, not only connected, but touching upon each other's heart uh, to the best possible way that we can. And the topic here chosen, futuristic research or future research in disaster resilience uh, is so so much that relevant to uh, not only engineering faculty uh, but also all sorts of all kinds of things that we live in so here of course uh, while uh, making this plan you have already planned everything only i came in between uh, in the, uh, and then we we made both the institution together and about 700, 800 participants uh, are part and parcel of this occasion. So on behalf of our uh, executive director, Major General Manoj Kumar Bindal, and my team over here, that uh, my all faculty members, we are eight, uh, four professors, and then four assistant professor. Also, we have host of young professionals, uh, more than 50, they are working in each one with us, one of them have joined uh, joined here also, Abhinay. Uh, so I uh, I take this that let uh, this uh, flow of knowledge uh, under the umbrella of Vidya Bardaka Sangha and its creations for the young generations uh, that should go long way. Uh, as long as this civilization survive, let COVID third wave comes, fourth wave comes, or whatever wave comes. We have got the vaccines of our own, and we are going to take the lead, and we are going to supply this vaccine as a weapon to fight with corona, third or fourth, or, or all kinds of strains that it is bringing or hurting us. Whatever way it is motivated or as a bio war, whatever way it is, a, but we are not going to lose the war. It is, uh, it is so in the, under this interjection or under this occasion that uh, we assembled over here. And when we have assembled in this way, 
taking this online medium of communication as a part and parcel which you have created your college you have created this thing in this manner and connecting and extending uh, through youtube channel and other things in such a way that uh, really it is heads up to you uh, your organizing uh, capacity uh, and as well as uh, bringing this occasion happen in such a short period of time thank you very much and let us be together and it is uh, let us not define that by our coordinates that where we belong to but we belong to this world and this civilization as long as uh, we are there i think we shall continue uh, working together and sharing each other's ethos and work for the resilience uh, for the society making our young brands who are participants over here uh, as a uh, emissary to to not to fight only but to make this uh, earth a healthy and wealthy uh, living place in the name of eco restoration decade that what united nations has uh, started from the 5th june onward that there will be a decade of eco restoration so uh, that will open up uh, uh, that will open up among us to make many more such kind of uh, not only uh, just only specialized session but some kind of workshop or some kind of you know uh, ground work uh, that which will define uh, not only by what we speak but also through our groundwork with this art in the name of eco restoration thank you very much thank you so much sir for those kind and encouraging words yes we are proud of vidya vardhaka college of engineering and vidya vardhaka sangha but after listening to you our proud feeling has actually doubled thank you so much for those kind words i feel privileged to introduce our respected principal of vidya vardhaka college of engineering mysore dr b sadashiv gowda who is well known for his enormous patience kindness and intelligence dr b sadashiv gowda who is a phd in mechanical engineering from the indian institute of science bangalore has rich experience both in industry and academia during his 8 years of stay at malaysia as a professor of taylor's university he received excellence award from taylor's college for his academic excellence since 2007 dr b sadash gowda is associated with vidya vardhaka college of engineering and under his able leadership the institution has been successful in getting npa and nac accreditation and we are now autonomous too so that's our principal dr b sadash gowda i now request our respected principal to address us over to you uh, thank you madam uh, uh, good evening to all of you i am really happy to associate with the 3 day online training program on futuristic research in disaster resilience which is being conducted in association with the national institute of disaster management uh, professor chandan goes from nidm uh, our honorable uh, president sri gundappa gowda our honorable secretary sri p vishwanath professor s k prasad all the deans heads of departments all the participants uh, you know the researchers academicians uh, my colleagues uh, good evening to each one of you uh, disaster resilience is the capacity or the ability to respond in the event of disasters it could be the individuals communities organizations and states that recover without compromising long term prospects for development and uh, we have witnessed the covid pandemic that caused havoc in the country i already the earlier speakers have mentioned uh, that that caused loss of precious lives the economic downturn loss of livelihood and the competitiveness as a country so we have seen the immeasurable the outcomes of disasters so holistic and coordinated efforts among various agencies are paramount in effective management of disasters that include prevention mitigation preparedness response and recovery to make our country safer 
and disaster resilient, both natural and man-made hazards are to be handled very systematically. The three-day training program on futuristic research in disaster resilience is appropriate and timely. I hope a lot of new ideas will be generated, will be shared by the experts, researchers, for the benefit of the country and the world. I wish the three-day training program a grand success, and we are very happy that Professor Chandan Ghosh has participated in the inaugural session, and we are very happy to associate with NIDM. Thank you so much. I wish all the participants, you know, all the best. We hope that this kind of workshops will be conducted in association with NIDM very often. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir, for those inspiring words. I'm sure with your wishes, this training program is going to be a grand success. Thank you. Uh, it's a honor to have with us the most respected personality who is a true engineer. He is a definition for engineering. He's a definition for successful engineer. He's a definition for entrepreneur and also a leader. The city of Mysore was fortunate to have him as the first mayor of Mysore and also as the president of Mysore Industries Association. He is our most respected Honorable Secretary of Vidya Vardhaka Sangha, Engineer Sri P. Vishwanath. I request our Honorable Secretary to kindly present his address. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Honorable Secretary. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to associate myself on the three-day online training program of futuristic research and disaster resilience. I'm very happy that uh, decided by our Honorable President Kinder Florida, Kesha Ra Just give us a moment. Okay, sorry. There was some network issues. I'm audible. Yes, yes sir, sir. You are audible, sir. You are audible. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, uh, the chief guest, Chandan Gush, Dr. Chandan Gush, Dr. Sadash Yadora, S.K. Prasad, Dr. S. Dayananda, Dr. G.B. Krishna, Dr. Roman Omesh, Professor Panmani, Professor Raghavendra, and all the people who are involved with us in organizing this uh, three day program. Very happy. This is one of the uh, major issues which can be tackled by the civil engineers. The disaster uh, in the area where civil engineers just this in such a way that this should not happen or in case happen, it should be able to withstand. Uh, like RK uh, and uh, last slides and so many things. I'm sure that uh, this uh, three-day online training program will bring in many uh, important issues and uh, very repeated people are there on the, the on the list. I'm sure that they'll be able to put in more for college in the three days. I willingly, willingly, I will uh, uh, compliment the organizers and uh, a good future for this. Wishing you all well. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable address and also your encouraging words. Thank you. We have with us yet another eminent personality who has been very closely associated with VVC and has been guiding us through. Our respected guest of honor, Dr. T.G. Sitaram, Director, IIT Guwahati. He has joined us now. I would like to extend a warm welcome to Dr. T.G. Sitaram. Namaste. <laughs> Namaste I hope sir. you're able to hear me. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. I request you to kindly present your keynote address, sir. Yeah, yeah. Good evening to all of you. First of all, let me thank uh, my good friend, Dr. Prasad, professor and head 
Department of Civil Engineering of Idya Vardhaka College of Engineering, Mysore. Friends, this uh, event, that is three-day online training program on futuristic research and disaster resilience. Uh, it's a very, very apt uh, topic for India. We have just uh, in the midst of a disaster. The COVID-19 is also a disaster. Actually. So similarly, what uh, Professor uh, Asad and other his friends like Chandan Ghosh and other people who are trying to project is natural disasters. Actually, even the pandemic which has hit us is also one of the natural disasters. Let me congratulate the team to think about a research and a webinar on a topic of disaster resilience, which is very, very essential for any country uh, in that matter. I hope that the outcomes of the entire this three-day online training program, where they got to summarize the new topics, give new directions and ideas. I'm also seeing some of them are civil engineers. They're going to talk about the disasters like earthquakes, landslides, and then floods, drought. All are very, very actually close to the common man. And for uh, the, such a conference, or such a webinar, it's actually very, very useful to the society, wherein we can learn. Let me begin with a quote of Dr. Kofi Annan, former UN Secretary General. He quotes, while many people are aware of the terrible impact of disasters throughout the world, few realize this is a problem that we can do something about. So this is what this uh, seminar is going to talk about. That is the futuristic research in disaster resilience. So uh, basically, you know, people talk about all uh, everything is not a disaster. For example, the same earthquake happens in Greenland, where there is no population, no habitat, no buildings. And not even people uh, doesn't even report it because it is not a consequence. So we need to understand as engineers the difference between hazard, vulnerability, risk, and disaster. So let me take you through basically an hazard is a process where phenomena or human activity that may cause loss of life, injury, or health impacts or it could be a property damage, or it is a social and economic disruption, or environmental degradation. There is no such thing as a natural disaster, because it is a natural hazard. Earthquakes are not hazards. When it becomes a disaster, that is what we need to understand. These effects, whatever the earthquakes, landslides, influence the intensity and in some cases frequency of extreme environmental events such as it could be forest fire it could be hurricanes it could be heat waves floods droughts storms so disaster risk is therefore considered as a combination of the severity and frequency of a hazard and wherein the number of people and assets exposed to this hazard what we call vulnerability and to the damage. So, particularly the role of civil engineers in this is very, very important. And I'm very happy that Vidyavardhaka College of Engineering from the Department of Civil Engineering, this event has been taken up. So, the role of civil engineering communities in mitigation and recovery activities for a given disaster, both natural and man-made, is documented very well over a period of time. Civil engineers can save more than more lives than a doctor. So today we are in the midst of a disaster, of a pandemic, wherein doctor's role is very important. But 
in majority of other hazards you know whether it is earthquake landslides okay floods droughts role of civil engineering very very important presently you know in india we are actually a mega our cities are growing very fast large concentration of people are happening in urban areas and these are you know very risky proposition we are in so implementation of a pre disaster during a disaster what one should do and what one should do post disaster is also a very important disaster risk reduction is a systematic approach in identifying assessing and reducing the risks of a disaster it also aims to reduce socio economic vulnerabilities to disaster as well as dealing with the environmental and other hazard that the trigger them so disaster management one can say which is a range of activities designed to maintain control over disaster and emergency situations to provide a framework for helping at risk persons to avoid to reduce or recover i, I call it three r's reduce recover and you know impact of the disaster so disaster management is a cycle of activities that deals with situations that occur before during and after the disaster so you know we in india disaster management reasonably you know national disaster ndma disaster management uh, is very nicely constituted in some time in 2007 and uh, under the sendai framework for disaster risk reduction all of our countries including india can you mute please now a lot of a lot of noise is there can you mute all of you so sendai framework for disaster risk reduction is an international document that was adopted by the united nation member states okay uh, in uh, 2015 at the world conference on disaster risk reduction which was held in sendai japan and which is also endorsed by the united nation general assembly so it is in now it is a successor agreement actually to the hyogo framework of action so where in you know united nations have taken our resilience and all of us have taken uh, work all countries that will do something to reduce disaster in every country so sustainable development goals is also similar kind of a document which also addresses to reduce poverty in the country and the sendai framework basically sets four specific priorities for action understanding of disaster risk strengthening disaster risk governance investing in disaster risk reduction for resilience enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response and to building back better in recovery rehabilitation rehabilitation and reconstruction so with these few words i would not take much time to tell you this topic is very very important and uh, i congratulate again the organizers jointly particularly the vidyavardhaka college of engineering under the leadership of dr prasad and uh, nidm under the leadership of dr chandan ghosh professor nidm government of india both are my good friends so i congratulate them to think about such an important topic and also doing it in a uh, city now it doesn't matter where you do it because everything is online and i i heard recently you know one conference on disaster risk was done there in 75 countries people have attended which was organized by again one of my student dr sri valsa so it was amazing you know to see now it is we are global now india can make a global impact in disseminating what one should do during a or before a disaster during a disaster and post disaster so through this a lot of awareness will happen and resilience should be brought in the community so that we will be able to handle the disasters you know the first wave of uh, covid 19 disaster we were, we handled reasonably well in the second wave we lost many of the very close friends you know and family members however 
I think it's coming down now, and uh, hopefully we will come out of this soon and go normal again. You know, like what we used to do uh, before March 2020. Hopefully, I wish everybody you know, happy time so that you know soon we will come out of this great disaster which we are facing the entire world actually so i thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and i wish the program a great success i hope there will be some learning and uh, some lectures would be very interesting to many of you i hope uh, you will pick up some of these important topics in disaster resilience what one should do so i wish the program a great success thank you very much good day namaskar Thank you so much, sir, for presenting your keynote address. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on disaster and disaster management, and also about the role of civil engineering and civil engineer. Thank you so much. Simple and humble respects Mother Nature and wishes good for all. He is our respected Honorable President of Vidya Vardhaka Sangha, Sri Gunda Pagoda. I request our Honorable President to kindly deliver the presidential address. ಎಲ್ಲರೂ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ವಿ ವಿ ಸಿ ಸಿವಿಲ್ ಇಂಜಿನಿಯರ್ ವಿಭಾಗ ಮತ್ತು ರಾಷ್ಟ್ರೀಯ ವಿಪತ್ತು ನಿರ್ವಹಣಾ ಸಂಸ್ಥೆಯೊಂದಿಗೆ ಆಯೋಜಿಸಿರುವ ಮೂರು ದಿನದ ನೈಸರ್ಗಿಕ ವಿಪತ್ತು ನಿರ್ವಹಣೆ ರಾಷ್ಟ್ರೀಯ ಮಟ್ಟದ ಕಾರ್ಯಾಗಾರದಲ್ಲಿ ಭಾಗವಹಿಸುವ ಎಲ್ಲ ಅಭ್ಯರ್ಥಿಗಳಿಗೂ ಶುಭವಾಗಲೆಂದು ಆರೈಸುತ್ತೇನೆ ಹಾಗೂ ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮ ಯಶಸ್ವಿಯಾಗಲಿ ಎಂದು ಭಗವಂತನಲ್ಲಿ ಪ್ರಾರ್ಥಿಸುತ್ತಾ ನಾನು ಎರಡು ಮಾತನ್ನು ಮುಗಿಸುತ್ತೇನೆ ನಮಸ್ಕಾರ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸರ್ ಧನ್ಯವಾದಗಳು We have now come to the end of today's inaugural function. The sessions planned after the vote of thanks are presentation on coastal reservoir solutions for disaster resilience by Dr. T.G. Sitaram, Director IIT Guwahati, and presentation on research priorities in the field of wind engineering to restore resilient future by Dr. Selvi Ranjan, advisor, IIT Madras Research Park, Chennai. Before we formally close this inaugural function, Let us remember the words of Benjamin Franklin who said by failing to prepare you are preparing to fail so let us prepare now to never fail later thank you now i request the organizer of this online training program dr umesh pk to propose vote of thanks i request all the participants to stay tuned for the sessions over to you sir thank you madam <clears throat> good evening to one and all it is my great pleasure for me in proposing the vote of thanks on this special occasion of inaugural session of three day online training program on futuristic research in disaster resilience organized by research studio department of civil engineering vidyavardhaka college of engineering mysuru in collaboration with the national institute of disaster management ministry of home affairs government of india new delhi <clears throat> i would like to thank uh, major general manoj kumar bindal executive director and dr chandan ghosh professor of uh, nidm government of india for funding this program and for the active participation of uh, dr chandan ghosh in the inaugural function i wish to express sincere thanks to professor tj sitaraman director iit guwahati for being part of inaugural function and for delivering the keynote address we we look forward to listening you your lecture now sir i would like to thank our president uh, shri gundapa gowda vice president <coughs> vice president shivalingappa and honorable secretary p vishnath and honorable treasurer shri shaila ramanamar vidyavardhaka sangha mysuru for all the support and encouragement in organizing such events and for gracing this occasion i would like to uh, thank our beloved principal dr b sadashiva goda for his constant motivation and encouragement in organizing this program and being a part of this inaugural function my heartfelt thanks to our uh, dr our hod dr sk prasad department of civil engineering 
Vidyavardhaka College of Engineering for his continuous support and effort taken to organize this program. I would like to thank Dr. H.S. Uh, Dayananda, Dean Academics, and uh, Dr. G.B. Krishnapa, Dean R&D, for their support. I express my sincere thanks to the uh, organize, organizing coordinator, Professor Kanmani S.S. and Professor Raghavendra S.S. for their tireless uh, effort in organizing this program. Also, I would like to thank Mr. Balaji, Mr. Kumar Abhinay, and, and the <coughs> technical support team from NIDM, and Professor Rajit, Professor Manoj, Professor Girish, Professor Sachin, Mr. Pushkin, Mr. Avinash, and all other technical supports from VVC Mysuru. My sincere thanks to all the teaching and non-teaching staff of stud and students of VVC in general and civil engineering in particular. My heartfelt thanks to the participants for joining their hands in learning from, the, from this program, Futuristic Research in Disaster Resilience. We look, for, no, we look forward for your active presence in all three days of this event. Thank you. Thanks, one and all. Thank you, madam. Over to Thank Shukabhya, you so much. Thank you so much, sir, for doing the honors. I would like to once again thank all our esteemed guests for joining us for the inaugural function. Thank you so much. It's now time for our first session of day one, which will be delivered by our respected director of IIT Guwahati, Dr. T. T. G. Sitaram. I request Professor Raghavendra, Assistant Professor in the Department of Civil Engineering with Yavardaka College of Engineering, Mysore, who is also the coordinator of this event, to welcome and introduce our respected guest. Over to you, Raghavendra. Thank you, Rupa Priya, madam. Good evening. Thanks to each and every one of you for being here with us today. I'm very pleased to welcome everyone present on the occasion of the first lecture of online training program on futuristic research and disaster resilience being organized by Vidyavardhaka College of Engineering, Mysuro, and National Institute of Disaster Management, Ministry of Home Affairs, Government of India, New Delhi. First of all, I have the pleasure in welcoming the eminent researcher and administrator and today's speaker, Professor T.G. Sitaram, for the occasion. Welcome to you, sir. I also welcome Professor Chandan Ghosh of NIDM, National Institute of Disaster Management, New Delhi, for uh, Dr. S.K. Prasad, HOD, Department of Civil Engineering, VVCE, Mysuru, Dr. H.S. Dayananda, Dean Academic Affairs, Dr. Umesh P.K. and Professor Kanmani S.S., Coordinators, Richard Studio, Department of Civil Engineering, VVCE. I take this opportunity to welcome guests, all my colleagues and students. Most important for any activity is the participants. I know all of you have come together in large numbers to listen to Dr. T.G. Sitaram. I wholeheartedly welcome you all. I welcome each and everyone. I have a pleasure duty to perform, that is to introduce Professor T.G. Sitaram to all of you. He doesn't need any introduction. And I have also cut, cut short stating many of his achievements. Dr. T.G. Sitaram, Director, IIT Guwahati, has obtained his BE in Civil Engineering from Government BDT College of Engineering, Davangere, then belonging to Mysore University, India in 1983, Masters in Civil Engineering from IISC Bengaluru in 1986, and PhD in Civil Engineering from University of Waterloo, Ontario, Canada in 1991 in the area of geomatics. His areas of interest are geotechnical engineering, earthquake engineering, rock mechanics, geosynthetics, coastal reservoir, and underground dams. Dr. T.G. Sitaram, in his 30 years of experience, or 30 years of experience, has published over 500 articles, which includes more than 250 publications in international journals, 13 books, 77 book chapters, more than 100 international conferences. The list is endless. He is awarded with SP Research Award, Shamsher Prakash Foundation, USA, by SARC in the year 1998. So C.V. Raman State Award for Young Scientist, Government of Karnataka for the year 2002. 
William Wong Research Fellow, University of Hong Kong in the year 2011. Professor Gopal Ranjan Research Award 2014 awarded from IIT Roorkee. Amulya and Vimala Reddy Lecture Award in the field of sustainable development in 2014 by Indian Institute of Science. He has been visiting, uh, he has been a visiting professor in several universities abroad, guided 26 PhDs and many master students. I deem it an opportunity to present you to the audience for delivering the first lecture of the online program on futuristic research disaster resilience over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raghavendra. Uh, so before I hand over the session to you, I would like to inform all the participants about the rules. So while uh, sir is presenting, you can post your queries in the chat box during the session, but please mention your name and also the location that is from which place you belong to so that at the end of the session, we'll be able to take your queries and so we'll be able to answer all your queries. Now I request Dr. T.G. Sitaram to kindly take over. Over to you, sir. So kindly unmute, sir. You're able to see? Yes, Hello? sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Your presentation is visible. Thank you. Carry on. Yeah. <clears throat> so good evening, friends. Today's topic is something little, you know, different than what you usually hear. So I've titled this as coastal reservoirs in earthquake prone regions towards disaster resilient society. I think you have to wait till some of my introduction tell you because many of you might not have heard about coastal reservoirs. Friends, only 3% of the world's water is fresh water. And two thirds of that is tucked away in frozen glaciers or otherwise unavailable for our use. As a result, some more than uh, 1 billion people worldwide lack access to water. I think that's very, very clear in our villages. Even today, many of the village, particularly the women folk, carry water on their head every day. If she doesn't bring water to home, there is nothing to drink, nothing to eat. So totally 2.7 billion people find water scarce for at least one month of the year. Please understand this is a seasonal also. Water shortage is a very seasonal. So time memorial in the new because we get our water, we always think that water source is river, water source is tanks, water source is well. No, water source is only one that is rainfall. Source of water is only rainfall and it comes through the monsoon in India, that means we have a time varied water source for us. In the sense, in the months now, June, you know, the monsoon hits Kerala coast and goes up to Assam, where I am sitting and giving this lecture. It has already reached Assam now. We are only June 12th, June 3rd, actually, it hit the Kerala coast, and June 12th, the monsoon has hit the Assam. You can see how far it is spread into the country. And again, reverse monsoon will come in some time in October. So this monsoon is our source of water through the rainfall. And this water, what we receive in three to four months, earlier it used to come four to five months. Now it has compacted because of climate change. Everything happens in two, three, three months. And we need to store water and use that for nine months. Our ancestor knew how to store water. But somehow over a period of time, thinking very big, I will show you, we have 
facing acute shortage of water it is actually shortage of it is not shortage of water my punch line of today may a message is there is no shortage of water for india india will receive actually more than 1000 mm annual average rainfall cannot be called water starved country so what is star starving then it is actually storage starved country we are having a less storage of this water so let me take you through that and then particularly how that is related to earthquake prone regions and why coastal reservoirs are better than the large dams and uh, even i was talking to prasad yesterday that kasturi sagar dam kar sagar dam our uh, sarambi has built it but it has a specified lifetime i'm going to talk to you about also civil engineering materials how they will survive and also i will give you an idea about the international association of coastal reservoir research which i founded internationally which has attracted you know across you know the top top people across water resources uh, research so that you know i would like to share that information to you and then i'll conclude why coastal reservoir will be the futuristic storage reservoirs when compared to large dams so what is stress by country in 2040 this is a document prepared by the world resource institute you can see india is painted big in red color okay that means there is a ratio of withdrawal to supply close to 40 to 80% that means there is a large shortage united nation by 2025 more than two thirds of the world total population could be living in water stressed condition so but this is another picture the same institutions are even even in indian institutions will picture that you know all the green colored areas receive more than 1000 mm average annual precipitation that is rainfall that means a country which receives more than 1000 mm average annual how can you call water stressed country this is what the fun, fundamental problem we i have in defining that means we are doing something wrong and then say oh we are stressed same thing you know we are uh, doing a lot of uh, things which are not correct and then blame okay covid has come distribution of population and water resources if you look at it in asia 36% of water is there where the population of the whole world is 60% so reasonably water is also reasonably well distributed so water requires a storage because it is not a the rainfall doesn't come continuously throughout the period of 12 months so we need to store water where can we store water the water storage happens in through ground water or soil moisture in wetlands ponds tanks dams reservoirs water storage is very essential for irrigation for water supply and hydropower and also it will provide a buffer from flood management so many of the dams what we have built are what civil engineers learn that you know we can manage water i think we have mismanaged this water so far a lot more has to be accomplished in securing enough storage that's what i my punch line as i told you there is a shortage of storage not shortage of water in india there are countries where there is a shortage of water that is israel saudi arabia okay uh such countries when are mid, uh, any of the middle east countries where there is a shortage of water but we do not have any shortage of water water storage needs to be protected against viruses contaminations bacteria pollution and what not so what has happened is over a period of time the resident time of this water in our land is becoming smaller and smaller in different layers of the earth that is because of degradation of forest increased soil erosion have reduced the resident time of water so once it rains that too because of climate change rainfall also comes in a very short period like what we see in kerala okay the floods come very quickly 
and in urban areas this water simply you know bangalore itself you can see one hour heavy rainfall next hour it is completely dry even we cannot even notice that there was a rainfall why this is that is because that there is a quick flow of water and it reaches downstream because you know the rivers or uh, streams are the lowest reduced levels available in the area which will attract rivers and streams attract the all the water towards them because they are the lowest rl in that region so all the catchment is towards that rivers so due to soil erosion and siltation water bodies lose their capacity to store waters so more people definitely there is another problem we have more people population is increasing and also the consumption of water when compared to 50 years back and we are all now becoming you know westernized with the tap water and tap running taking shower you know all that and also industries consumption is large all these you know we are also using more water so that means more people more water usage and we have also tried to build more dams i will talk about that in a little while we are forgetting actually storing in the conventional ground with the way it used to be naturally used to happen that is not happening so where are these dams if you look at these large dams which all countries have built india is the third largest dam building nation in the world okay and how many dams you have built i keep on asking many civil engineers many of them don't even know because they don't even think about it so when we got independence in 1947 we had something like 300 large dams what is a large dam according to the international committee of large dams a large dam is a one which can store 1 million cubic meter of water or a dam which is more than 15 meter tall okay to store that water or a dam which is having a unique structure like an arch dam or uh, something very unique you know uh, structurally so then it is also called even though it is less than 15 meter we also call them as a large dam so if you look at this uh, population now I'm, i'm i'm showing you this picture where the population where the cities having more than 10 million so india has a large number of cities which has more than 10 million or more what we call mega cities similarly china india in asia only there is a large number and if you go to america again you know there are only three cities which has 10 10 million or more so this is the urban population urbanization most of most of the people will live in cities mega cities appear in coastal areas so even in india if you look at the most of the mega cities except living bangalore you know it's a very hard growth actually you know if you look at chennai or kolkata or mumbai you know all of them are actually on the coast coastal area will have the most severe water shortage problem okay uh, also because as i told you uh, we recently we are seeing a lot of floods during the monsoon and then soon after that you know uh, in december we have a shortage of water so where are our dams so the dams are all actually upstream and people are on the downstream so people are migrating to coastlines in india also now and many many cities are coming up and the kind of planning what we are doing connecting through bharat mala and all that there will be a lot more activity because of ports new construction of ports and other transport you know multi transport uh, methodology is what we are following so here what most of the dams which we have built actually are in the middle course of the rivers and the middle of the river uh, not in the upstream so once it comes out for example if you look at it uh, uh, western ghats itself the rivers actually take birth in western ghats and some of them flow eastwards some of them flow westwards best flowing rivers are actually smaller in length about 100 100 km but their gradient is very high in the beginning and once they reach the coastal areas they'll become flat and then reach the ocean particularly the arabian sea but majority of the rivers actually our indian rivers flow to bay of bengal majority of them including the himalayan rivers like ganges okay all of them actually flow into uh, the uh, bay of bengal so dams and earthquakes dams and earthquakes have a common 
you know something common why because dams are actually uh, built in active earthquake areas why why i say that is the reserve basically the rivers are one of the faults or lineaments okay so when you build a dam it will be across the a river or a, uh, across a river so automatically you are actually building on a fault so reservoirs also can trigger earthquakes koina has taught us and many because of the ingression of water over a period of time it can cause also micro earthquakes people have already studied about what is called as reservoir induced earthquakes and some water supply structures are susceptible to earthquake motion as well unstable slopes that have been weakened after the saturation like surrounding hills can like italy you know the dam which uh, broke because you know some of the neighboring hills become saturated and submerged into the water body then it displaces the so large quantity of water it wore up the dam so the consequence of a dam or a water supply failure is very high when compared to earth when when you are looking at earthquakes So the effect of dam failure on people and structures downstream are dramatic and obvious. So let's look at where this kind of large earthquakes can happen. So all, all of you know now that the, the large earthquakes can happen on the plate boundaries. So these plate boundaries are basically there are seven large plates, and uh, India is in an Indo-Australian plate. Actually, Indian plate is moving in north-northeasterly direction, hitting the Eurasian plate. By by forming the Himalayan mountains, so the the red dots is the basically the boundary of these plates and what we call the Pacific plate, which is called a ring of fire, where you know Japan and all those countries come in, and even some of the Indonesian countries also will come in there. So the active volcanoes, plate tectonics, are all happens at the interplate boundaries. So generally, smaller earthquakes occur in the intraplate. like you know what you saw in the buj or uh, latur earthquake were all called intra plate within the plate some earthquakes happen but they generally don't have the magnitudes like what happens of the inter plate so our planet is definitely restless we can do nothing about controlling the earthquakes okay that's why i am keep telling you we can never control its activity inside what happens and cannot control its vibrations as well but what we can do is we can actually build structures to withstand these vibrations so the major challenge is to understand how these vibrations occur so why dams are often built in active earthquake areas as i already told you dams are usually built in valleys in the river course river itself is a fault majority of the cases under compressional tectonic force rivers are thrust faults produce uplift therefore many dams have an active fault dipping under them so please understand all these are sitting on a ticking bomb any anywhere any any place either intra or interplate they can trigger earthquakes so once that earthquake is triggered that your structure should have with stand that so we need to understand how to build dams on the earthquake so on the another topic which i talked about is the reservoir triggered earthquakes where large new reservoirs can trigger earthquakes it's a uh, sort of a concept which is sort of reasonably accepted Uh, well reservoir triggered earthquakes are often referred to as reservoir induced seismicity but use the term induced is now becoming unfashionable otherwise people accept that these uh, can cause a minor small earthquakes the energy released in a reservoir triggered earthquake is normal tectonic strain energy that has been prematurely released because of the reservoir so causes of the failure of the dams if you look at all over the world earthquakes have generally not caused by major majority of the failures please note that earthquakes have not caused the uh, dam failures earthquakes have generally uh, less than one majority of the failures have occurred because of foundation problem geotechnical engineer and some of the list i don't want to go through even india also we had many dams which are failed and surface faulting and all that but let me come to the <clears throat> today's topic of disaster risk resilience uh, that sunday framework for disaster risk condition signed by all countries in 2015 2030 we are not very far away nine more years to go and uh, that's a very less time to really make a substantial reduction of disaster risk and losses in lives 
livelihoods and health and the economic physical and social cultural and environmental assets of persons and businesses in the countries where these population or communities are living so if you can look at the right side picture substantial reduction to reduce global disaster mortality reduce the number of affected people globally reduce direct economic loss is the objective of disaster risk reduction plan but how can we do that that increasing the number of countries with national and local disaster risk reduction strategies that's what the sendai framework has planned they said increase the availability and access to multi hazard early warning system multi hazard is a very common phenomena today ladies and gentlemen that means a rainfall and an earthquake or a rainfall and a flood rainfall and a drought so these cover the hazard will become now double rather than the single yeah and happens at the same time and that can cause a lot of problems so multi hazard so increase the availability and access to multi hazard early warning system including tsunami can come together and with an earthquake so substantially enhance international cooperation in developing countries that is where you know large number of countries have signed this sendai framework for disaster risk reduction so next question i am putting to the audience is are these large dams what we have built to store water are forever are they going to sustain for a very long time everything has its a finite life span many dam structure actually if you ask a civil engineer for how long he is going to design or for how many years he design generally an expected life of 50 to 100 years that means we have built large dams in india sometime in 1970 assuming that 2020 already 50 years is completed okay even including the kr sagar dam what happens up to 50 years are you going to remove kr sagar dam so people have need to ask such fundamental questions you know when are these going to become extinct even assuming that it is going to survive another 50 years that means by 2070 you might have to remove kr sagar dam so what you are going to do are you going to build in the same dam at the same location what happens and when you are going to demolish it so i want to tell you friends nearly 800 dams have been removed in the united states in the last 100 years <laughs> that is also one of the other reason is average yearly sedimentation ratio many of the you know western ghats rivers bring lot of sediments so most of our dams also will get slowly filled up himalayas definitely upper himalayas most of the dams are always full with sediments no water storage so if you look at the world story see what they have built in 1900 already some of them have been removed so but 1950 1960 where the large construction happened 70 now if you look at 2010 no countries are building large dams friends understand that except india india is building i will tell you the numbers india is building 300 dams even now but global dam construction has become almost zero by 2010 itself that means almost 10 years older no and let us ask a question what i asked you previous question when all these dams will become dead each dam for example when kr sagar will become dead so if the dams life span is 100 years how many dams will we have so if you look at it by 2150 okay by 21 this is based on actually sedimentation calculation of 1% i calculated by 2150 most of these dams have to be removed even all these dams what i was talking about all over the world which has been built in 1900 to 21 in 2010 by 2150 most of these dams have to be removed so if i ask a question if that is the source of water for us for irrigation power that is electricity irrigation and food okay and also drinking water so what our community or the people in the world in drink we are from which dams in 2150 so unless we build large dams but as i told you large dams are no construction no country is constructing because they stopped in 2010 itself okay so if they don't construct storage structures forget about only large dams where are you going to drink the water from or where are you use the food 
of uh, the food generation or you know electricity generation and water prime minister nehru said in 1960s 1962 actually bakranangal dam was uh, foundation was inaugurated he said temples of modern india are large dams definitely he was right at that time but i don't think he is right at this moment now bakra project is something tremendous something stupendous something which shakes you up when you see it bakra the new temple of resurgent india is the symbol of india's progress that's what the statement by honorable uh, former prime minister pandit nehru i always feel enthused and invigorated whenever i come here that's what the one nehru said on the uh, but if you look at the same thing you know sardar sarovar recently 2017 on the prime minister narendra modi ji offered it to the nation you know when the construction started for the sardar sarovar 1964 or 1962 actually foundation was done in 1962 for the sardar sarovar that means we almost took 59 years or 58 years to complete sardar sarovar you can see the kind of you know the issues So my next question is where is our next temple in the 21st century ladies and gentlemen why did i put this that means these are all the dots what i have put there is our dams large dams how many dams we have constructed state wise distribution of large dams maharashtra has close to about 2000 dams okay madhya pradesh has 800 dams in 1947 we had less than 300 large dams and most of these dams today we have 5700 large dams in india and india ranks the third in the world in dam building after united states and china so but how much water we are storing in all these close to 6000 large dams less than 10% of the average annual rainfall received in the country that means close to 8% that is not enough this is the challenge that means even though you have built so many large dams you are only storing 8% of the average annual rainfall received in the country this is not my this is not my data this is the uh, data of the uh, central water commission so my question is so where is the 90% of the average rainfall goes so another 10% maybe in you know small tanks small keres kuntes or 8% another 3 4% into the rocks crevices in the deep rocks which you cannot extract so basically 82% of the annual rainfall still joins the ocean still joins the ocean 82% of the annual average rainfall received in entire india still gets into either bay of bengal or arabian sea so you can see now the issue water is plenty ladies and gentlemen but the unfortunate thing is see and another thing you have to remember even if you build another 6000 dam you will be storing only 5% of that water so don't be scared that you are not letting any water to the ocean but still water will go into the ocean and from that water cycle will be completed only so nothing to worry about so even even our generation does another 6000 dams in another 100 years we are not going to be extinct with water water is plenty it is not no shortage of water there is only a shortage of storage whether the dams large dams are the solution that's the question large dams are the solution or the way in which we are building like what nehru pandit nehru said modern temples of india is going to be still the modern temple of india that's the question the question is i think today it is not relevant so that's the kind of dams are not going to be work for us so what are the other solutions if you look at the other solution as i told you inland dams that is called what we call large dams or no no so we started talking about interbasin transfers you have seen ganga that is, that is we are trying to connect godavari to krishna and many like that kaveri to some other river you know something like that are also are happening across the country that means if there is a water in ganga can we bring it but in a country like india it's very difficult to bring gang ganga to southern india very very challenging let me tell you through the land because it's a way it's going to cause a lot of environmental damage and is already seen because water is a state subject we are seeing a lot of court cases and litigations are happening between the two states and you saw 
recently for 10 you know tmc of water entire cabinet of karnataka has to go to goa to really discuss this is the kind of a things that are happening the another area is the waste water recycling definitely waste water recycling we need to do but please understand community acceptance for drinking water no no you see even in a, there was a survey in singapore saying that you know they call ne water this is the water which is the toilet water which is clean even though it is much cleaner than kaveri water people don't want to drink and they, they did a survey in singapore also forget about india india we are all highly religious we will never touch that water we don't mind uh, dirty, drinking dirty water from ganges but not the toilet water which is clean maybe 100 percent so even recently even bangalore water supply board after their sewage treatment what did they do they tried to leave it to go kolar and you saw the lot of you see the lot of vegetation so the wastewater recycling is a good phenomena but may be used for industrial purposes not for domestic consumption not for even agriculture consumption because even farmers doesn't want that water okay and then then left it desalination take the ocean that uh, take the salt water from the ocean and clean it up basically, basically desalinate and highly uh, concentrated salt brain will 50 percent will go back into the ocean another 50 percent uh, is the fresh water which you get but this is after foolishness to do in india but unfortunately we are doing it most of the coastal cities are doing it but it is utter foolishness because you are allowing 82 percent of the fresh water flowing into the ocean and take the same water and clean it with a high energy intensive desalination plant. I think this is really a foolishness. This is not a technology for India. This technology is maybe good for Israel, where average rainfall is less than 90 millimeter, or which may be good for Saudi Arabia, where is something like 150 millimeter. We are getting 1000 millimeter and above, and this is not the solution for us. So what is the next solution? This is where I bring in coastal reservoirs. And then I think from here onwards, I'll go very quickly. So see what do I mean by coastal reservoir. This picture is basically shows the water cycle. You see, earlier, you know, in the civilizations, we used to simply go uh, live along the rivers and uh, the villages were there, you know, and then we started building dams in the middle course. And then now we have dams have to shift downstream and go into the ocean or close to the ocean or close to the coast. Luckily, that is where the people are also concentrated. A lot of people, a lot of large cities, mega cities are located there. So in that context also, but only one problem would be there. If the people are living upstream, then, you know, how do you really pump it out? Because I, I think if you know many of the large dams, what we have constructed in Upper Krishna project and all those, you know, people are using lift irrigation there also. That means lifting water by almost 30, 40 meters. Even city of Bangalore getting water from Kaveri River by almost like, uh, uh, you know, the elevation difference is close to 300 meters. But what is the beauty about this is this area can store large quantity of water at least 20 times more than the demand, even considering the population, you know, growing to about 10 billion uh, in another maybe 50 to 100 years. So the first generation coastal reservoirs are, were built actually in Singapore and many other countries by blocking the river mouth. This may be good technology for, for countries like Singapore, where they can control the flow, quality of flow into the river. Because see, you have all the urban and villages and all across the river, and which will bring a dirty water. And if you close that, then you are basically collecting dirty water. This is what we call first generation coastal reservoir or no, no. But they have done this and then showed. So I said in engineering, we can show some technologies not properly used or doesn't work. That is where they left it. It is like, you know, now electric vehicles are coming back after 100 years. So if you know, Germany started very early, but the mafia of the petrol and diesel actually killed the electric vehicles. Now, after 100 years, it's coming back. So the second generation coastal reservoir is basically your reservoir will be just off the river course. So the dirty water or a clean water will go 
on the side through this so that you know all the continuous flow will be there you can also uh, fishermen also can go up fishes can go up all you know living uh, animals in the water can also continuously function like normal like earlier and it could be even i'm, I'm just show this picture very casually here but it could be even little away from it because we have the piping technology today we can store water away from that so this topic what we when we started with iacrr now united nation water has accepted our concept in the wwdr document of 2019 uh, they have already included the coastal reservoir and referred many of our work myself and many of our colleagues okay work on this so let me take you through what is coastal reservoir versus large depth coastal reservoir is near the coast unlimited it could be in the sea also dam design is very high pressure for the inland reservoirs so you have to have used concrete and other materials but in case of coastal reservoir very low pressure and the dams are also not very high it is, water is also very still there please understand when it reaches the coast water in the river will become the flow velocity will become lower when compared to in the middle course where the velocity of flow is very high so you have to build a dam which can resist that pressure seepage by density difference pollutant is the major issue but second generation coastal reservoir can handle that very well that means you can actually collect water during monsoon when the the water is very reasonably cleaner and the rest of the season you can allow the water to go to the ocean so the emigrant cost that movement of people or displacement of people is very minimal so that's what i talked about sardar sarovar dam uh, took 54 years or 55 years because of movement of you know many submergence of villages towns which very difficult to displace them even now if you know the upper krishna we are not storing to the maximum height for the dam what we have constructed because <coughs> bagal court will not be there bagal court will submerge if you store up to the maximum height in <coughs> that one so to like that you know we have to actually half of bagal court is actually shifted to new bagal court i only talked about bigger city but there will be several villages have actually submerged into the uh, backwater reservoirs so water supply is the issue is the by gravity by pumping here in the coastal reservoir but today the kind of technologies are there for the generation of the electricity we can use the coastal reservoirs so where are the coastal reservoirs netherlands has built in 1932 india has built in 1974 hanir makamban for agriculture south korea has built hong kong has built hong kong actually had a ration water rationing earlier it has now uh, completely you know survives on the coastal reservoirs completely fresh fresh water china has built the second generation coastal reservoir have been there chinkosa which is about 200 or 300 kilometers away from shanghai city and uh, fantastic you know that's i i was there for two times i was really impressed with the kind of technology entire shanghai city 70% of the drinking water comes from one reservoir which is right in the delta that is called chinkosa reservoir i'll show you a picture so singapore has built in marina barrage it received a environmental award okay singapore is a small country as i told you it can block this is a first generation coastal reservoir united kingdom has built cardiff so like that many india is also planning to build a large large one of the largest world's largest coastal reservoir in the gulf of kambat uh, it is a indian water project it is called honorable prime minister who was then chief minister of gujarat has planned this i'll show you some details about that it is under construction the second generation coastal reservoir is the one which i wanted to focus we can create new wetlands and this picture is much more clear now bypass polluted water or <coughs> on the water in the lean season can go here only during monsoon we can actually divert the good quality water into second generation reservoir which is a convex water body which can go through the wetland pre treatment and create good storage feasibility of second generation coastal reservoir water quality improvement it is temporal separation spatial separation wetland pre treatment all can happen without desalination water can really in a very good state of drinking water sustainability generally there is no negative in the second generation coastal reservoir negative impact found from existing coastal reservoirs 
renewable it cannot be silted also why because the siltation will actually can go in the bypass okay so the coastal reservoir technology we use a lot of soft dam technology which uh, what geotechnical engineers are coming with uh, geo bags and all those things you know they can construct very very effectively today construction technology is also simpler significantly to reduce the construction cost for barriers and gates so coastal reservoir is a selection of best catchment and best water quality because the entire catchment of the river is available at the top so i'll just give you an example of when you are taking a bath if you want to catch water whatever you taking a bath at the head you get nothing and you in the middle of the body you can get maybe half of that but when you collect at the toe maybe even though dirty okay so it is almost like your rain water harvesting you know what the concept they say 10 minutes you run through your you know taking your bath dirty water will go away after that there everything is a fresh water you can collect it back actually this is a similar concept for the coastal reservoir ladies and gentlemen consequently water quality is comparable with inland dams no first flush and environmental impacts are minimum no river flow reduction no cost to relocate people and many this is the shanghai's experience shanghai's water body is the right side picture which it shows and which goes through a wetland new wetland has been created and two years they have constructed the entire reservoir okay only two years 2008 chinkosa reservoir started its construction 2000 started pumping fresh water from the sea without desalination clear water right in the middle of the ocean that means on either side there is a ocean ladies and gentlemen so look at it this is the coastal reservoir and there is an underground tunnel which is created to the shanghai city and which supplies the drinking water coastal reservoirs in the world north korea marina barrage in singapore you know singapore very people very few people might have seen this any of you walked around it without knowing that is a coastal reservoir so advantage of coastal reservoir no harm to the river basin or alteration to the river course no disturbance to the forest cover or submergence of the land no physical displacement of the people agriculture activity also in the coastal region can be augmented because there is a quite a quite a bit of land which is affected by the coastal erosion can be minimized groundwater recharge intrusion of saline water into wells will reduce fresh water dredging can happen and many many advantages so the other one as i told you what energy is required for you to pump even 100 km upstream luckily you can because the depth of water in this coastal reservoir is so small we can store entire area can be generated to use to generate solar energy tidal energy okay so using the to solar and tidal and wind energy you can generate large power large quantity of power which can be used to even pump water what we are doing even in inland dams see if you go to north karnataka you will see large kind of pumping pump uh, lift irrigation schemes from the canals of uh, upper krishna left bank or right bank canal are being done so it is not a new thing ladies and gentlemen so we can do that here also getting into almost close to 100 kilometers so that means entire coastal karnataka could be benefited roadways over the sea wall so you can also use the roadways i'll show you some pictures will definitely see that fresh water fishing navigation and tourism will generate real estate opportunities and as i told you new land will be formed if you see the uh, the netherlands coastal reservoir you will definitely appreciate that because it was built in 1932 how the new city was born and it also can serve as a deep water fishing or bar increase in industrial activity so let me take you through one of the case study i'll not today i don't have time to show you all the case studies i have all of the case studies you can look at over in our book we brought out a new book on coastal reservoir in elsewhere so just google coastal reservoir and myself is the first author and six other authors are there across the world who are going to who have written different case studies across the world so this kalpasar project of honorable prime minister modi's location is gulf of kambat right here the location okay so this the vision is to have a contour canal from this reservoir from this reservoir this is called kalpasar dam see uh, this is connecting almost bhavnagar to the edge so it is actually south uh, the north of the narmada river <coughs> so there there could be a little plan change for this also so in this is a building you see this will actually reduce the distance between baruch to bhavnagar almost 400 km otherwise now we have to go all the way like this 
but now you can directly cut across and reach. So it, there are many advantages. It's, it's going to be a largest freshwater reservoir for irrigation, drinking, and industrial purpose. For you want to know, simply type Kalpasar in Google. You will see the entire project, and there is a geotechnical investigation is going on now for the project. So small changes could be done for this to because we don't require such a large water body. So some of our friends, you know, both from Australia and they were, were working like this. So keep the tidal basin on the Bhavanagar side, but still the build and cover the uh, Narmada River also so that the water from Narmada because these Dada and Naisaga Reserve rivers are all very small rivers when compared to Narmada. Even though we have built Sardar Sarovar, still there will be a lot of water in the monsoon which can be taken so the grass storage is still very 16 billion cubic meters 16 billion cubic meter 64 long kilometer long dam across the gulf of kambas but not too high it is hardly about 20 meters then lone road can be built on that so my concept is i even actually applied for a patent on this rover mala i said you know you have the coastal reservoirs on the coast and this is anyway zero mean sea level there is nothing to cut, nothing to excavate. So instead of connecting Ganga to Kaveri through the midst of the uh, country where you are creating a lot of damage to the villages and towns, here it could be buried pipelines below. Connect. So today there may be a day, maybe 200 years down the road, there may be a day where Ganga can be connected to uh, the rivers like Netravati and other things through the coast. Okay. So this is a concept which is very, very simple on a paper. Okay, so let me conclude. Coastal reservoir with downstream water management will be significantly used as a source of water. Please read the word downstream water management. So of a river, that better to catch water at the toe. So that's the concept is downstream. So the entire catchment area is available to you. China's experience shows that with very large river basins, wetland treatment may be needed. It creates a new land and new wetlands. Which is what environmentalists want. Case study shows that coastal reservoirs are viable. Second generation coastal reservoir is cost effective, environmental friendly, socially acceptable, and has high quality of water. Ladies and gentlemen, India is not running out of water, but water is running out of India. So please tell somebody who comes to sell you desalination plants that's not a requirement because that's utter foolishness. You leave the water which is going through the same land to the ocean and collect it back and clean it with a very high energy intensive technology. So instead of that, store that water somewhere in the near the coast, through the coastal reservoir. Desalination is expensive and environmentally not sustainable for India. I'm not saying this is for uh, Israel. Cost of coastal reservoir versus alternative water diversion scheme is much lower. Engagement with community, government agencies, and other stakeholders is a key aspect addressing because a lot of awareness has to be brought in. Uh, please uh, no, kindly mute here. I am concluding now. So this International Association for Coastal Reservoir Research was inaugurated in Kuala Lumpur. I was the first president, founder president of this. So you can see uh, all of our friends from across the world uh, assembled there. Even Dr. Parsarthi, my friend, good friend from Bangalore is also here. Okay. You please, if you are interested, look at IACR.org. What is interesting in reality? Once we started in 2017, the past president of International Association of Hydro Environmental Research is my vice president, past president of Inter Inter International Water Association, Professor Glenn Diger from uh, Minnesota, he is my vice president. Okay, past president of IWRA, International Water Resources Association, China, he is my vice president, Professor Zia Sun, Professor Hubert Savineje, past president of International Association of Hydrological Research. Okay, uh, hydrological sciences uh, from Netherlands is also the vice president. That means you can see why all these top presidents of the top notch institutions, which are 100 year old, have come to coastal reservoir research is because they strongly believe that IACRR can provide an alternative. So this is my team. So you can see many Indian faces because I was there. Okay. So these are some of the books of, of mine. I will not go through that. So if some of you are interested in earthquake hazard and assessment, you can look at it in Springer. And we are organizing the first ISARR conference, which was actually postponed this year to next year. 
They are holding the 9th, 12th November 2022 uh, in uh, Shonga, sorry, in Nanjing, you know, which is very close to the coastal reservoir uh, of uh, Shinkosa Reservoir. So you will also get the chance to see Shinkosa. If you know, COVID pandemic allows us, we are going to do uh, offline conference uh, during November 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I've taken exactly the time allotted to me. Uh, last message is store water and safe future. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. That was an excellent session with excellent uh, information shared with us. Thanks for sharing all the knowledge. And I, I, I was really impressed about the team you have with you. Thank you so much. So now we are open for questions. And uh, the QA session would be handled by our panelists, uh, Professor Chandan Ghosh and uh, uh, Dr. S.K. Prasad. Uh, I I'm sure our participants have a lot of questions to ask. And uh, I I'm sure uh, Professor T.G. Sitaram will answer every question of yours. So before I hand over this uh, session to uh, both the professors, I would like to just inform all the participants that a feedback link has been shared with you. You can check on your chat box. Uh, you can uh, uh, you know, submit your feedback using that link. And another reminder to you, all your e-certificates will be received only if you have registered on NIDM portal. So please ensure that you have registered on your portal. So these are two reminders for our dear participants. Now I would like to hand it over to Professor Chandan and Dr. Eski Prasad. Over to you for QA sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rupapriya. Uh, yeah, Professor Sitaram, as usual, it was a wonderful session. And in fact, you know, we civil engineers, most of us like this concept of coastal reservoir. So there have been a few questions, uh, you know, mainly because of, uh, I would say, lack of ignorance. And uh, uh, yeah, before uh, I have listed a few of them before that, if uh, Professor Chandan Ghosh would like to say something, I'll be very happy. Uh, yeah, uh, it is, uh, of course, uh, the, the very theme of this session, uh, very theme of this <coughs> session, especially the entire three day session, futuristic research which uh, Professor uh, Sitaram uh, has highlighted the problem about the dam. And then where is the solution? Finally, that in the last uh, 15, 20 slides that he has given, and where in between his presentation, what special highlights about that, whatever dams are there in our country, China or USA, by another 100 years, uh, because their life is 100 years, they are all going to be out of date then what is the alternative because dam construction takes so much of time like terry dam it took more than 25 30 years to construct it now we don't we do not go for any dam so that way uh, 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 storing water like the example that hong kong singapore and giving a futuristic outlook to to the participants to every one of us it is a mind boggling and uh, so the solution is to be found out his uh, famous statement that India is not having shortage of uh, uh, water. Rather, water is going out of us. We are not able to store them in a proper. So coastal reservoir system and the kind of example and, kind, uh, and also uh, the concept, ideas, and research, and uh, uh, work that which is going on in many of the countries in the last uh, so many years, giving a historical perspective of uh, this kind of coastal reservoir uh, and how Shanghai city is uh, uh, getting benefited out of that, how Tokyo city is holding all its water, rainwater, through a rainwater harvesting. They don't change like he has very, 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 uh, very particularly said that whatever in the coastal area that we are we are going into changing or putting a machine to convert uh, very heavy uh, salt water into soft water, which is not the right kind of way because it takes out most of the minerals out of the water. 
So uh, giving all those uh, uh, examples and as well as futuristic solution and current solution where 82% plus water going out. And so even if we are able to hold it 5% or 10% of that, our most of our water problem will be solved. So in this regard, I think uh, it is a very timely and uh, rather I would say that it is not a futuristic, it is the uh, present current uh, state that if we take it right now, then only we can see over the years, over the time, we can take benefit of uh, such measures in our city areas or you know across the country. Excellent. I, I really agree with you, Professor Chandan. Anyway, uh, as I said, uh, Professor Sitaram, there have been a few questions mainly out of uh, ignorance. I'm sure uh, you know, you'll know you be happy to answer them. Uh, uh, I'll just read out. One of the questions is, you know, how clean water can be stored okay, uh, uh, in the sea, separating the sea water? What is the method? What is the technology used there? Yeah, I think it's a very, very simple and straightforward uh, question. So we know, even if, for, for example, I, I, I will answer in a very different way. Please. If you go to Mangalore, if you go to Mangalore, there is a fisheries college. Okay? Hmm. They, they have a small pond which is a fresh water next to the ocean. <laughs> How did they do it? So today with the geotechnological solution like geomembranes, you know, you can create miracles. There is nothing you can do. You don't need another thing, another concept. You can also use the density difference. Density difference of the seawater you know, so sea water is more dense. dense. More so dense. It will be at the bottom. It will be at the bottom. So if you create a still water, still all the way, you don't need any technology. It will be at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anyway, so okay. This, there is nothing, uh, there is no challenge for this. Okay. I told okay. you. Okay. The 1930s itself, Netherlands has built it in the roughest seas of the north uh, okay. ocean. Mm. Uh, nothing okay. has happened. It's all fresh land, fresh water. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, yeah, another uh, question is, you know, you talked uh, talked about Shanghai Quinkosha, uh, you know, um, uh, plant. So all these uh, uh, will be at the sea level or much lower. Then pumping that water towards land, you know, will be more expensive. And uh, what's your opinion on that? No, actually, I told you, even in Upper Krishna, if you go and see, a lot of water is pumped only. <laughs> if you are not known, you go and see that. Most of the unlift irrigation schemes only. Okay. Okay. And okay. Uh, anyway, but as I told you, I've also given you, you can generate solar wind because my water depth in the coastal reservoir is so small, you can generate so free energy non-conventional energy okay which doesn't any cost anything because nature solar so you can definitely when you have large amount of power today you know so solar rooftop is 1.8 rupees same thing if you take it from a water dam it is eight rupees per unit so i think uh, the days are not very far where we'll be using majority of power from solar and wind and uh, also through the wave automatically the cost will be very very cheap and actually it is not a cost actually you would like to use that energy what you generate because energy is again another problem then if you see the analogy what i gave you today water storage is a problem same thing for energy also storage is a problem so there is a fantastic analogy between water and energy thank you thank you very much yeah. and uh, you talked about large dams and you talked about you know uh, their capacity how long they are going to stay so naturally there was a uh, concern shown by uh, participants so one of the participants asked what is the situation of Linganamakki dam across Sharawati any dam why you go to Linganamakki <laughs> go to Mysore only <laughs> KR Sagar dam is leaking if you have gone there KR Sagar dam what uh, our uh, suddenly built it is already leaking profusely. So if you repair, yes, our large, uh, 
the, there is a national program on repairing dams. Okay, uh, and if you repair, it is like putting a stent in your heart. You know, <laughs> you, you might survive one more, uh, you know, ten more years. Not beyond that. <laughs> you need to understand. You need to understand. Concrete is not a material for infinitely to survive. Best is the earth dams. See, if you some of you for civil engineers who are there at the site, if you want to see a dam which survived two thousand years, please go to Trichy. Ten kilometers from Trichy, there is called Kalanani Anikat. Kalanani Anikat. Anikat is a dam. Okay. Mm. Even today, which is existing, what Raja Raja Chola built it. Raja Raja Chola in 2000 years back. So <laughs> that is the kind of technology which we can talking about. So earth, earth and rock are the best material and compared to concrete. Concrete gives you some advantages which can be molded, mounted in whatever shape you want. But there are materials which are much better for survival and sustainability. For a longer time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, one very general question. Uh, how can you reduce disaster, protect earth, and get back green earth for uh, you know healthy living? <clears throat> so simple, you know, construct coastal reservoir. If a dam breaks, okay. For example, uh, uh, I think Chandan Ghosh will tell you if Bakranangal breaks tomorrow. How many downstream towns, villages will be submerged? Can you imagine? But if a dam, uh, I don't know. If a dam, what I <laughs> talked about, kalpasar breaks. If a dam kalpasar breaks, nothing, nothing will happen. Everything goes to wash. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the uh, same way, uh, this Krishna Sagara dam, KRS dam, God will, you know, let's not break. But if KRS dam breaks, Downstream of the many villages and towns are vanished forever. True, true. So uh, these were the main questions from the participants. And uh, maybe if uh, uh, again, Professor Chandan Ghosh would like to throw some light or ask some questions, it will be nice. Uh, it is, uh, of course, not the questions. He has elaborately uh, given all kinds of all facets of having coastal uh, reservoir and how to make it, how cheap it, uh, how much cheaper it is, and in comparison yeah. to the large dam. So I think yeah. it is worth uh, uh, going through uh, his presentation again, which is on record. Uh, and not only that, uh, some of the uh, queries that someone is saying that already it is answered. What can be the best substitute or solution? Uh, uh, for uh, of dams of a country like India, which is still developing country with huge population. This is a generic question, but it is already indicated by even answers as well as the presentation. And so then another uh, small uh, doubt is that uh, by Kanmani, uh, yeah, oh, it is someone, uh, Dayananda. Yeah. Uh, does the coastal reserve concept concept affect the ocean ecosystem? Does the okay. <laughs> You see, even if you build another 6,000 dams, you can only store 5% yeah. more. 5% yeah, yeah. of the water, what you are having. Okay? Yeah. So, that means you know still 80 percent water will go into the ocean so, no change in the ecosystem of the ocean there have been so many questions actually uh, very happy that clearly shows uh, professor tg sitaram has been flamboyant very clear yeah uh -huh. uh, i will uh, just try to read out one more yeah uh, sir what is the role of check dams usually constructed inland for controlling the Controlling as well as storing flood water towards water demand and the groundwater recharge. So this is from engineer Avik Kumar Mandal. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Actually, this is a, which I didn't touch about. Um, there is a check dams, underground dams. Actually, we should go back to what our ancestor used to do. Store water in our villages, towns. See, 
this is the one technology we forgot you see where were the nirgantis kannada thane ellaru bala jana ha prasad uh, no no we we also have many from outside maybe oh, it's that? better you speak in english yeah <laughs> see, small villages earlier in karnataka used to have water man is called nirgantis so this water man is the man who will distribute the water for farmers okay so okay. that concept you know we should actually bring it back so today our tanks and uh, keres kuntes are all become uh, nobody is looking after them in the pretext of all the deputy commissioners and other thing so i feel we should bring back the small tanks small water bodies in small villages towns back and check dams and uh, many other things can be done check dams water wells you know water ingress in injection well you no know, injection wells all uh, more than that trees large trees please plant large number of trees you plant that will actually take the water down it will not go flow laterally so large number of trees you plant start planting which is a fantastic thing trees can hold water in that region they only so that is the concept we had earlier in older generation which we have forgotten so to bring back another another concept is underground dams underground dams is the another one which i do underground dams is another concept which is fantastic for the inland so which i will talk to you some other time but we need to actually conserve water but when i talk about coastal reservoir i'm talking about large quantity of water not what you can store in check dams okay, yeah, okay. check dams are very small quantity okay i'm talking about three times kras dam storage <laughs> okay can you can you imagine three times storage of kras dam and for example uh, the kalpasa it will be the largest reservoir in the whole world excellent excellent thank sir. you okay yeah yeah uh, I, uh, again you know same question but uh, yeah uh, maybe i would like you to answer again uh, from professor mangala keshav what are the materials suitable for construction of coastal reservoirs you told about geo bags maybe one more time you know you just explain what material is best you, we, we don't need any material we will use the wash and bottom whatever sand is there <laughs> only we use the geo bags are only technology please understand geo okay. bags are not the material material okay. is sand material okay. is sand okay. okay okay sand and silt we fill that with the geo bag so that it will make a uh, like a concrete it, it will be confined okay yes exactly okay yeah. excellent excellent so there have been many many appreciations also uh, uh, what can uh, maybe i'll just take one more Diksha Modgil has asked, "What can be the best substitute or solution of dams for a country like India, which is still a developing country with huge population?" You have already answered that. So anyway, I, I just want to tell you: in inland check dams, injection wells, and uh, tanks, and small tanks. Small, small is very beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make very big dams. Okay, small is very beautiful. make that and if you want really large because we are also going to be an industrialized nation for industries you require large water large quantity of water build coastal reservoirs and when we want to build mega cities like chennai growing into three times chennai then you know build a coastal reservoir otherwise we can do very small interior with arresting water inland so plant trees some villages maybe just plantation of trees is enough it will hold water for full year good good trees with good roots uh, can hold water for you for the entire year okay so uh, maybe sir one last question there are many but you know because of the time constraint we'll just go for one last question this is from avi kumar mandal again uh, what are the specific challenges for making coastal reservoirs from the scenario of indian coastal topography mindset challenges is asking mindset <laughs> <laughs> all right a very short but very beautiful answer i think i think you know we will then uh, uh, hand over the session to the uh, um, you know mc 
So uh, thank you, thank you for uh, very nice answer, very crisp and nice answers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, I must mention that the, this interaction you know, between you three and taking questions and answering, it was very interesting. We thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you so much for that. Namaskar. And now uh, it's uh, time. We are closing the first session. So and I request our uh, HRE, Dr. S.K. Prasad, to propose a word of thanks. Who okay. you, sir? Thank you. Thank you, Rupa Priya, ma'am. Uh, it's always very pleasant to thank someone like uh, TGS. I always, uh, you know, uh, lovingly call him TGS, Professor TGS, Professor TG Sitara, who is very simple and is always willing to help academicians, researchers, students, you know, like me. I have known him for uh, nearly 25 years. Uh, I just have to mention here that, you know, wherever he goes, he will bring charisma and he will simply enhance the quality quality of an organization, quality of a program, whatever you take. In fact, you know, that is the reason why we brought him over here. And, uh, you know, there are many, many, you know, uh, things he has done. He has, uh, you know, developed geotechnical engineering division, CIS2, Pet Indians of Science. And now, you know, he has been instrumental in taking IIT Gohati to a great height. So, in fact, you know, I feel very proud and happy about uh, many of his achievements. Just if I want to name a few, uh, you know, uh, uh, a few very recent ones. You know, IIT Gauhati has been listed 41st in research globally by QS World Ranking, World University Ranking 2022, 2022, very recently. And, uh, uh, um, you know, above this is Indians of Science Bangalore. So this stands second in India. And IIT Gauhati has joined you hand. Tell, you know, Professor Prasad, you should yeah. tell them three years yeah. back they were nowhere. <laughs> yeah. So three very clearly you can see the you can see the presence of Professor TGS. Uh, and yeah. then you know IIT Gauhati has joined hands with Eureka Forbes uh, to provide the Corona Guard. And uh, that was a wonderful uh, uh, session <laughs> I heard on the news. Then 22 professors from IIT Gohati, including Professor TGS, are listed in the top 2% researchers by Stanford University. And then uh, Professor TGS is the advisor and foundation expert for the reconstruction of uh, Ramajan Mabhumi at Ayodhya. So just to name a few of them, uh, as, uh, as already you know, I mentioned, uh, IIT Gohati has risen uh, during his less than two years uh, stay there. He will be completing two years very soon. So, sir, today also, as usual, you are very, very flamboyant, crystal clear about your objectives. And some of uh, uh, your ideas, you know, uh, probably they will uh, become strong after five, ten years. You will have the vision much, much earlier. And uh, uh, you spoke about uh, coastal wire, wire, reservoir solution so well. And then, you know, how uh, this can help this uh, uh, our theme of disaster resilience. I think it was an opt uh, session and being the first session, it has really triggered a lot of uh, uh, young minds, uh, uh, you know, to think in a different way. I sincerely thank you on behalf of uh, Vidya Vardhaka College. I just want to say one fun, uh, last word in this session. Please, please. Uh, Sachin. You, uh, you have just mentioned that maybe five to ten years it will take to bring that concept when mindset is to be changed anytime. Just now we can change the mindset. Not only that, the kind of revolution that we have brought in due to COVID, that nowhere in the history of development of the COVID vaccine that it has taken less than 20 years. But Correct. the scientific community has taken it on the platform January, or like India started in less than nine months. So, uh, so the change that we have to bring in uh, seeing that so much of even the Karnataka state itself is a northern part of that, which is also witness to so many farmers and so many things that we do, cricket matches that we have to bring in. So a lot of mindsetting triggers that our people are facing every day, every moment. So only thing is that we have to start right now. So, uh, so when we can develop a vaccine less than a one year time, and when we are planning now, more than 70% of our population will, population will be vaccinated within four months or five months. When we are thinking that majority of our vaccine can be 
exported in uh, into, uh, after meeting up our demands. So I think we can do wonder. Very Anything true. Is very very true. And if uh, somebody like TGS can inspire, definitely things yeah. can be possible. <laughs> so once again, I sincerely thank you, Professor TGS, on behalf of myself, on behalf of our college, and on behalf of uh, uh, NIDA. Okay. And then uh, Chandan, Professor Chandan, again, my sincere thanks to you also. You know, um, you have always been, uh, you know, thinking very practically and your uh, intentions are to create awareness. And in this regard, you know, whatever uh, Professor TGS has done today, I think yeah. we will be able to take it forward and we look forward for, you know, many new things to happen, uh, you know, under his guidance or the direction he has uh, set up. So I need to thank everybody here, thank all the participants. And uh, we'll have to close this session because, you know, we have to go for the next session. So thanks one and all. Thanks to, you know, uh, my uh, all technical team. Thanks to uh, Professor Rupa Priya and everyone here. I'm going to uh, say thanks. And I feel very happy that it was a successful beginning. Therefore, you know, we can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Rupa Priya Thank also you. for a very professional way of uh, dealing each and every uh, every part of this uh, session, including the inaugural Thank session. You. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's very really nice to hear that from you. Okay, so it was a great start, sir, with this uh, first session and your involvement in it. So now, uh, yes, we'll officially close this first session and we'll get started with the second session. So, dear participants, now it's time for our second session. So, we will take five minutes break. A new link has been sent to all the participants to join for the second session. So we'll take a, a quick five minutes break and then rejoin. Now with 6.25 sharp, we will rejoin at 6.30 p.m. Yeah. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. Thanks to you. Thank you, Rupa Priyam. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.